Heavenly Father, now as we dig into your word, we just pray, Father, that you would give us understanding, that we would see a bigger picture of who you are, of your love for us, and your plan for our future. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been, over the past few weeks, looking at the plagues, and this, we looked at this uh, hi hieroglyphic a few weeks ago. Um, you can see here, this is Pharaoh, and this is Moses, and we are um, down here toward the end of the plagues today. And you can see Moses is growing larger, and Pharaoh is, well, he's down on his knees. Lord, have mercy on Pharaoh. God is lifting up his servant Moses. The, we're going to go back to Exodus chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, and let's read it together. It says, So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. We've been seeing how that's playing out as we look at these plagues in Egypt, and today we pick up in Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourself handfuls of soot from a kiln, and let Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh, and it will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and will become boils breaking out with sores on man and beast through all the land of Egypt. And if you're not familiar with a couple of those words, it's the... the um, so like the ashes from the fire, sometimes it's very fine, right? Like dust. Picking up the ashes from the fire, and Moses was throwing that into the sky. You know how the, that, that can just blow in the wind. And so Moses took that soot, he threw it up into the air, and it went out in dust over all the land of Egypt. I had to look back at my sermon from a couple weeks ago because I thought, wow, I already covered this boils thing, and then I remembered, oh yeah, last week we talked about how Job had the same curse from the devil. Normally, this, these things, these plagues and these evils come from the devil. In very special circumstances, God is sending plagues upon humanity. So this is a very special and unique circumstance. Also at the end of this world, right? The Bible tells us that God will send plagues. And so, um, here, the, this plague comes. Moses throws the soot into the air in front of Pharaoh, and they took the soot from a kiln and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it toward the sky, and it became boils breaking out with sores on man and beast, and the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as uh, on all the Egyptians. By the way, I should have put it here as a vocabulary word. I know most of us know it, but if you don't know it, a kiln is an oven in which you bake bricks or other different things to fire them. For bricks, it's to make them really hard so you can build a house, right? So a kiln has a special oven, and probably a kiln, because of its heat, probably the ashes are very fine. That's my theory. I've seen a kiln a few times. So the soot was thrown into the air, and again, it's a miracle of God because the ash that Moses threw would only cover a small area, right? But God causes this to go out and it becomes boils on everyone, including the magicians. Uh, it's interesting, the Bible now calls them magicians because they really are fakes, right? They do not have the power and now they're sick at home. They don't have the power to heal themselves, nor to heal Pharaoh or the Egyptians. And so they're at home with boils and... How do you think they feel? How many of you have had a boil? How many people have had a boil? Don't be shy. Most, how, how did you feel when you had a boil? Auntie Patty said miserable. Did you feel like almost you wanted to die? It's pretty painful, right? And then you multiply that, as we talked about last week, you're in a terrible state because it was probably like Job, where it was even boils on the soles of his feet. He couldn't get comfortable in any position. He was just in pain, and the Egyptians were in pain. And here's what the book Patriarchs and Prophets says. It says, Moses was next directed to take ashes of the furnace, sprinkle it toward heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. This act was deeply significant. 400 years before, God had shown to Abraham the future oppression of his people, under the figure of a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, 
He had declared that he would visit judgments upon their oppressors and would bring forth the captives with great substance. In Egypt, Israel had long languished in the furnace of affliction. You can imagine that picture, right? The Israelites suffering there under the oppression of the Egyptians, suffering in the furnace of affliction. Does anyone think they know a little bit of the furnace of affliction? Anyone felt a little bit of the furnace of affliction? The struggles of this life? I know you're not raising your hands, but we've all felt it, haven't we? It's maybe, maybe not like the Egyptians, but in some, for or, some form or fashion, we have felt the furnace of affliction in our lives. And this act of Moses was an assurance to them that God was mindful of his covenant and that the time for deliverance had come. Amen? The time for deliverance had come. Hallelujah for the Israelites that time had come. Exodus chapter 9, verse 12 and 13. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did not listen to them. Just as the Lord had spoken to Moses, then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Say to him, Thus says the Lord the God of the Hebrews, What? What does he say to him? Let my people go that they may serve me. Have you heard that before? <laughs> I think so, right? Let my people go, Pharaoh. Now, I know we've addressed the hardening of Pharaoh's heart several times. We, we studied that Pharaoh, um, the Bible says that ten times Pharaoh hardened his heart, or it became strong, is a more literal translation. Ten times it says God hardened his heart. So ten times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart during these passages. Ten times it says God hardened his heart. This is also from the, the book Patriarchs and Prophets, though his haughty... This haughty tyrant, speaking of Pharaoh, had by his crimes forfeited the mercy of God, yet his life had been preserved that through his stubbornness the Lord might manifest his wonders in the land of Egypt. We're going to look at some scripture that's going to bear that out. We've already looked at some in the past. In his dealing with Pharaoh, the Lord manifested his hatred of idolatry and his determination to punish cruelty and oppression. Pharaoh claimed to be a god, You'll recall perhaps earlier that Pharaoh had said to Moses, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> he had said to Moses, who's your God? I don't know your God. Pharaoh had claimed to be a God to the people of Egypt. They worshiped Pharaoh as a God, a representative of the gods. And now Pharaoh, thinking he is God, bringing oppression on God's people, had even, and I want to remind you how evil Pharaoh was. I'm just going to remind you for a moment how evil Pharaoh was. He was so evil that he was even killing the Israelite male children. That's how evil he was. Is that evil? It's evil, isn't it? That's how evil he was. So don't, let's not, uh, let's not uh, whitewash it and say Pharaoh wasn't a not, not a very nice man. He was an evil man. He was an idolater, and he was cruel. They were beating and oppressing God's people, and now he is facing God's judgment. And so, just one more thought here from patriarchs and prophets. God declared concerning Pharaoh, I will harden his heart that he will not let the people go. There was no exercise of supernatural power to harden the heart of the king. God gave to Pharaoh the most striking evidence of divine power, but the monarch stubbornly refused to heed the light. Every display of infinite power rejected by him rendered him the more determined in his rebellion. The seeds of rebellion that he sowed when he rejected the first miracle produced their harvest. As he continued to venture on his own course, going from one degree of stubbornness to another, his heart became more and more hardened until he was called to look upon the cold, dead faces of the firstborn. It was, a, it was his ongoing choices. We look at the scripture and it talks about the grieving of the Holy Spirit. The unpardonable sin. Some people are very fearful that they've committed the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is not one choice that you make one day that you wake up and you decide you're going to turn away from God. It is a series of choices over a period of time. The hardening of your heart as you reject the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and the scripture says in John 3.16, God so loved Israel that he gave his only son that if Israel believed in him, whoever in Israel believed in him 
should believe in him, they would not perish but have eternal life. Oh, you didn't say amen to that. Wait. Auntie Patty says that not, that's not what it says. What does it say? How many people did he love? Does that include Pharaoh? Does he love, did he, did God, did Pharaoh have a chance at salvation just as everyone else? Did he have an equal opportunity for salvation like you and I? If he didn't, then how could he be fair and just? Do you want to serve a God who, like that, who, you know, he picks and chooses. God picks and chooses he's, who he's going to save. And, well, Pharaoh just didn't have a choice. Do you want to serve a God like that? I don't believe the scripture bears that out for God. Jesus, it's Jesus' words. He says, God so loved the world. Whoever believes in him should not perish. Pharaoh had an opportunity. When I hear the, the, the doctrine of predestination, it makes me want to throw up. God's not like that. He wants to save everybody. He gives every single person opportunity upon opportunity. And Pharaoh had opportunities for salvation. This was his opportunity over and over again during this period of time in a very special way. And it isn't that God wasn't calling Pharaoh to turn to him his whole life. But this was, this was an escalation. This was a, a point in his life where Pharaoh was making decisions. What would he do? Would he choose to rebel? Would he choose God? Could God, could God cut the, the uh, plague short? Could he have seven plagues instead of ten? Could the firstborn be saved? Did God change sometimes his judgment when he judged someone in the scriptures and then he relented when they repented? I think of Jonah and Nineveh that was very sick. And <laughs> Nineveh repented and God, God turned back from his anger. Amen? And he saved that city. He saved that city through the prophet Jonah. And so Pharaoh had opportunity upon opportunity. The seeds of rebellion that he sowed when he rejected the first miracle produced their harvest as he continued to venture on in his own course, going from one degree of stubbornness to another. His heart became more and more hardened until he, called, until he was called to look upon the cold, dead faces of the firstborn. Lord, have mercy. For this time, I will send all my plagues on you, God says, and your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For if by now I had put forth my stand, hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would then have been cut off from the earth. God in his mercy had preserved Pharaoh's life. He said, if, if I hadn't held back, you'd already be dead. God is the source of life. God had sustained Pharaoh. God goes on and he says, but indeed for this reason I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Why does God say these things are taking place? He wants to proclaim his name through the earth. God is in the midst of idolatry. God is saying, I want to show you there is still a God on his throne. He's the real God. He's the real deal. He's not these fake gods, the creation that the Egyptians are worshiping and so much of the world is worshiping. God is saying, I want people to see and to remember that there's a creator God, the one who made you, rather than exalting yourself against me. And so he says, still, Pharaoh, you exalt yourself against my people and will not let them go. God had a plan. He wanted to give people an opportunity to see and to know him in the midst of an idolatrous nation, and to know that he is God. Exodus chapter 9, verse 18, 19. Behold, about this time tomorrow, God said, I will send a very heavy hell, such as has not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore, sin, bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety. Every man and beast that is found in the field and is not brought home when the hell comes down, on them will die. And the one among the servants of the Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Even in the midst of these plagues, God had some mercy. He gave them a warning. He said, you can seek shelter 
and be saved. If you fear the Lord, you can be saved. Seek shelter now. Bring your livestock into the barns. Bring your servants into the houses so that you will be saved. Amen? That you will not be killed by this hell that's coming upon Egypt. And so the Lord, the, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that hell may fall on the land of Egypt, on man and on beast and on every plant on the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky. The Lord sent thunder and hell, and fire ran, rain, ran down to the earth. The Lord rained hell on the land of Egypt. It's what the Bible calls a strange act of God. It is not God's desire to destroy. He's the creator. He's the one who made us. He loves us. But sometimes God uses extreme situations for extreme reasons that sometimes we even have trouble relating to and understanding and comprehending. His judgments fall that he might bring salvation. Sometimes he brings these things to pass. And so God rained down hell on Egypt. There was hell and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hell very severe, such as had not been in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hell struck all that was in the field through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hell also struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. That's hard to imagine. Now in the tropics, hell is very, very rare, I read. How many of you have seen hell here in Guam or in the tropics? And it's not happened, right? It does occur in the tropics. Sometimes I read it's very rare. Um, in the mid-latitudes, it does, the hell does happen. How many of you have seen hell? Most of us that have grown up in the States have seen hell at some time, right? Now, my, uh, the tradition in the United States and Europe is that the wife's family pays for the wedding. Not the tradition in many places in the world, but that's the tradition um, handed down from the European culture. And so um, our wedding was paid for by hell. <laughs> well, actually, the insurance results from hell. My father-in-law and mother-in-law had this, um, car it was called a caravan. <laughs> and the caravan was in the hell storm, and it had all these little dents all over it. It wasn't a bad hell storm, but it dented the car, and so the insurance came. The car was perfectly drivable. I know Lee mentioned that um, his daughter got a Prius. It had hell on it, so they sold it for a lot less. Drives perfectly, not so pretty. Um, and so the insurance results came and they paid for our wedding, is what my father-in-law said. <laughs> I, anyway, that's what he said. And so they had the wedding van. <laughs> and so, um, you know, God works in different ways, but I just thought of that in hell. And that, that was small hell. It's not big hell. If it hit you on the head, it would hurt, and you'd say, ouch. And, you know, as kids, I remember going out after a hell storm, 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 sorry, storm, hell storm, picking up the hell off the ground. It usually seemed to happen in summer, and it would be very cool outside and all these little hailstones on the ground, little pieces of ice. Well, this is what happened in Egypt, except it wasn't small hailstones, it was... It was big hailstones. That's a real hailstone. In fact, um, this um, is a real hailstone. The hailstone fell in the yard of Les Scott Vivian of South Dakota, July 23, 2010, 31 ounces. That's uh, almost two pounds and 19 inches in diameter. It shrunk a little bit in his freezer because there was no power after the hailstorm. So it's not quite full size, but 19 inches. I think it's almost like a basketball size. How would you feel if the a bas a ice basketball hit you on the head? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be feeling anything anymore, would you? That's deadly. And this is the kind of hell that fell on the entire country of Egypt, destroying everything that was in the field. It destroyed everything in the field. Now, they had already lost livestock, right? A plague on the livestock. And they had felt the pain on their bodies. And now this hellstorm com hell comes. And the Bible tells us, only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were sent, I'm sorry, were, were, sorry, let me back up. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no, what? There was no hell. 
Isn't that amazing? God was protecting his people through this time of tribulation. He was providing protection to them. And Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I love you guys. I want to keep you around because I love you so much. No, he said, I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Some people would call that a bring me to Jesus moment. Hallelujah, Pharaoh is repenting. He's on his knees, and he's saying, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Is that what Pharaoh's saying? <laughs> Sometimes when we're disciplined, my mother disciplined me. I am thankful that my mother disciplined me. I know sometimes people are abused by their parents. I recognize that. I don't feel that my mother abused me. I feel that the discipline was for my good. And I thank God that I am the person I am today because I'm part of my parents' upbringing of me. Amen? I realize sometimes we've suffered abuse. And I'm not condoning abuse. Some people have suffered abuse as children. That's not what we're talking about. But healthy discipline from parents is a blessing. And, but sometimes when we're disciplined... Oh, we're crying, but you know why we're crying? Because we got caught and we got disciplined. The parent's job is to try and bring their children not just to cry because they're disciplined, but because they're repentant and they say, I was wrong, and it's from their heart. I'm sorry, Mommy. <laughs> I still call my parents Mommy and Daddy. I'm sorry, Mommy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Forgive me, right? I'm sorry, sister, that I hurt you. And it's from our hearts, and that was not Pharaoh's repentance. He was sorry that he got caught. He was sorry for the pain. He was crying because of the pain that hurt, but he wasn't really in his heart saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me for my treatment of the Israelites, for killing their, their, their children, and for beating them unmercifully, and for treating them so horribly. Instead, he was crying out because he felt the pain. You know what I mean? That's the only reason he cried out. He felt the pain. And so, it was not repentance. He says, make supplication to the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder in hell, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. And Moses said to him, as soon as I go out of the city, I'll spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease. There will be no hell no longer. And you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know Moses, Moses continues, he says, As for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. And the Bible says, Now the flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear, the flax was in the bud, but the wheat and the spelt were not ruined, for they, were, they ripen later. Has anyone ever experienced a famine? A drought? Anybody experienced that? If you lived on the outer islands in Micronesia, where we live on a, basically a beach with coconut trees and a little bit of a taro patch and breadfruit in some of the islands. When a drought comes, it is very serious. And my understanding of Guam is it means we have. That is what some people say the meaning of Guam is. It's we have. And the understanding that I have come to of that is because a high island has so many resources. Guam Unless it's a biblical plague, you know, biblical plague, Guam always has water. Guam always has food. It may not be a lot, but it's enough to sustain because Guam is a high island. It has an aquifer. It has big trees. And Guam always has. In the midst of Micronesia, there are other high islands too. Pohnpei always has. Always has. The low islands, they don't always have. And the History books tell us that the reason that um, the Refuash or the people of the Carolinian Islands came to Guam and then ended up in Saipan is because there was a famine. And they came to the Spanish governor and they said, please, can we come and settle? And he said, you can, yes, we will let you go and settle there in Saipan. And Saipan's a high island also. It doesn't have as many resources as Guam. It actually is more prone to droughts. The aquifer is a little bit salty. Um, I'm not so pleased if you're watching online. We're, we love Saipan. It's a beautiful place. I spent a lot of time there. But Guam is really blessed. It's very blessed. Not a salty aquifer. Always has. And so I'm not saying it couldn't come to a point where the drought wiped off everything in Guam. But I'm just saying 
than in general Guam always has, even in a drought. And so um, when, a, when a hailstorm comes, can you imagine the bread, breadfruit being taken out? The coconuts being wiped out? The only thing left, can you, what's left? Maybe the taro, the camote, right? It's the only things that are left. Everything is wiped out. Do they have any livestock left? No livestock, right? They don't have now any of, no rice. The rice is gone. Rice is a grain crop, right? It's flattened, finished. Now they've, they're left almost down to famine ra rations. In fact, the taro is a famine ration. It's a famine ration. When there's nothing left to eat, that's when you have the taro in the outer islands. It is a reserve. It's the refrigerator. It's the deep freeze. It's that reserve for that time of famine. And so the Bible says, but as for you and your servants, I know that you do not fear God, Moses said. So Moses went out from the city from Pharaoh, spread out his hands to the Lord, and thunder and the hail ceased. The rain no longer poured on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he called a prayer meeting, and he repented again, and he said, Lord, have mercy on me. Oh, that's not what your Bible says? I'm glad you're checking on me. It says that he sinned again. He hardened his heart, he and his servants. Wow. I'm glad we're faster learners than Pharaoh. Amen? I pray that we're faster learners than Pharaoh. Amen? Can you say, Lord, have mercy on me? Amen. Lord, have mercy. Help me to soften my heart instead of hardening it. Amen? Help me, Lord, to cry out to you not only when the pain comes, but in the good times too. Amen? To remember you when the blessings come too. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He did not let the sons of Israel go just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart, the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them that you may tell in the hearing of your son, of your grandson, how I made a mockery of the Egyptians, how I performed my signs among them, that you may what? May know that I am the Lord. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourselves before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow... I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that, they, that no one will be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has escaped, what is left to you from the hill. They will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. Then your houses will be filled and the houses of all your surf servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, some, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day that they came upon the earth until this day, and he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Yesterday I went out and I was looking at the plants. My wife has more and more plants and I saw the plants' leaves were eaten and I showed my mom the plant, all these plants' leaves were eaten. Later in the afternoon Beth came and she, she said, Matt, these plants' leaves are eaten. I said, I know. She said, here's the problem, all these caterpillars. <laughs> she said, you've got to deal with these caterpillars. To get rid of them now. <laughs> I said, honey, those are going to be butterflies. I don't want to kill them. So I threw them. <laughs> I said, will they be able to make it back to these plants? We'll see. <laughs> but it was more than caterpillars on a few plants, wasn't it? I remember as a child um, what's called a, um, a um, cicada. There's the, is it the 15 years or the 30 year? How many years? 17 years in the United States, certain parts of the country, the 17 year cicada. It lives in this, I guess, embryonic form for 17 years, and then it hatches out, and I'll tell you that summer, they are just singing. If you have trouble sleeping, you won't be able to s sleep because they are so loud. Day and night, they're just zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
Um, it made the headlines because they called it a plague of bib biblical proportions. I don't know if you heard that in the news or not. I know you like the news. Sorry, I, I'm picking on you. But, you know, sometimes these things, um, commentators and news reporters like to report it was a flood of biblical proportions, right? Or it was a something of biblical proportions. I think we little understand what, what it really means. And this plague was beyond our comprehension. But in Africa, it was very serious. And it, and it says a single square kilometer swarm can eat as much food in a day as 35,000 people. And it's very serious be, because these, these swarms cause serious famine in countries there in Africa, in the Middle East. They can cause famine, they can cause death. And, the, and in this instance, with our modern tools, they brought pesticides in and they were spraying from planes. They were trying to kill these locusts um, because they would wipe out the crops and these people would starve. Very serious. Now, the National Geographic was warning of the dire consequences also of spraying these poisons, these herbicides, man becoming involved in nature. But very serious consequences. But in Exodus, this is a biblical proportion famine. It was extremely serious beyond, I think, what we can imagine today. Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they can serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? <laughs> Please, Pharaoh, have mercy on us. You're going to destroy us if you don't stop this. Let them go. And Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. And he said to them, what did Pharaoh say? Go, serve the Lord your God. Who are the... And then he says, who are the ones going? Oh, come on, Pharaoh. Okay, you're a little bit slow here. Um, Moses was very clear to begin with from the very beginning what God had commanded. Let my people go. Um, Pharaoh, uh, if you haven't gotten the message already... I don't know, is it going to take ten times to be repeated to you? Moses said, we shall go with our young, our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds. We shall go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. And then he said to him, this is Pharaoh, Thus may the Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, take heed, for evil is in your mind. Moses, you're trouble. I know what you're up to. You're trying to steal my slaves. There's trouble brewing, Pharaoh. You want, I'm sorry, there's trouble brewing, Moses, Pharaoh says. You're trying to steal my livelihood. And Moses said, not so. I'm sorry, Pharaoh says, not so. Go now the men among you and serve the Lord, for that is what you desire. So they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. I, and I suspect, I suspect that not all the words that Pharaoh said are recorded here, but that, because I suspect that the Pharaoh was using some not very nice words that we wouldn't use in church, and hopefully we wouldn't use them other places, huh? Would you agree with that? Pharaoh was pretty hopping angry. He, and so they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come up on the land of Egypt. Eat every plant of the land, even all that the hill has left. Whatever was left, whatever wasn't killed of the livestock, whatever wasn't killed by the hill, whatever is left, the locusts will eat it. And so Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. The Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt, settled in the territory of Egypt, they were very numerous. There had never been so many locusts, nor would there be so many again. That's how many locusts there were. They covered the surface of the whole land, so the land was darkened. How many locusts were there? There were enough that the land was darkened. They ate every plant of the land, all the fruit of the trees that the hill had left. Thus, nothing green was left on the tree or the plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. You can remember, may, maybe you can remember what a, what a typhoon is like here in Guam. Norianne, do you remember that? Not quite, right? Joshua, do you remember what, that? Not really. 
Anybody under 25 today hardly remembers a real typhoon in Guam, right? It's been a long time. I'm praying it will be a long time, but... <laughs> it's an unnatural pause in typhoons in Guam. Saipan knows what it's like to feel the pain. And after a, ty a serious typhoon, there's hardly a leaf left on the trees. I mean, you, you didn't know what was in the jungle, but you find out well, all the trash and garbage and cars and everything in the jungle because, I mean, the trees are, are laid bare. But this was even more serious. There was nothing left green because the locusts ate everything. Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, and he said to them, I love you guys. He said, I've sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once. Make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me. Really, Pharaoh? Then he went out from Pharaoh and made supplication to the Lord. So the Lord shifted the wind very strong to a west wind, which took up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did not let the sons of Israel go. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky. There was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for how many days? Three days. I was thinking about how we might imagine this darkness might be. The dark of night is not very dark, is it? In the jungle, it's a little bit darker, right? Have you ever been somewhere where you can't see your hand in front of your face? Can you imagine that? Some of us may have not been in a place like that. Of course, inside a house, in a closed room, it might be very dark, right? Pitch black, how about a cave? Anyone ever been caving? That's dark. I was talking to my mom last night. I was imagining some of my childhood experience. My dad loved to go caving. We were going to caves with some flashlights, lots of caves in Tennessee going into caves that few people had been into. We did go with the Pathfinders into a cave where you could camp. And <laughs> I don't know how old I was, but I told my mom, I remember that experience. And it was very stinky. <laughs> you could smell certain spells in there. There were bathrooms in there, <laughs> restrooms. And we were camping with a large group. We estimated it was several hundred. Not just Pathfinders, there were other, camp there was a huge cavern, and lights off, pitch black, right? The kids, it took them a long time to settle down, and anyway, you can imagine, but in a cave, it's pitch black. Um, they did have some lights over at the restrooms, but pretty black. In a cave, you shut off your lights, right? And you can't see anything. It is pitch black. It doesn't matter if somebody waved their hand in front of your face, there's no light deep inside a cavern. There's some beautiful caves here in Guam, by the way. Um, one is over in Asiga. It's called Cool Cave. My wife took me there. Um, Gordon and Kay had gone over there with some folks, and Beth had gone and went to them. So we went and did some little spelunking there. Beautiful formations. I should have put some here, but a cave is pitch black. Very, very dark. And can you imagine um, that, that that's what happened? Can you imagine in the middle of the daytime, no light whatsoever? Can you imagine? It's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's, you know, an eclipse is something, right? All of us have lived through some kind of eclipse, and it's pretty dark outside, but it's not pitch black by any means. It's not nearly as dark as it is at night. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which what? May be felt. A darkness which can be felt. A heavy covering of darkness. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky. There was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be detained. Even your little ones may go with you. Oh, wow, Pharaoh's getting generous here. He's saying, you just leave your flocks and herds, and I'll let you go. And it's interesting, because God is working here. He, the, the Egyptians worship so many things. And have you heard people say, yay, Ra? The sun god, R-A, the sun god, right? 
<laughs> it's the God of the Egyptians. They worship the sun too. Um, he is considered to be the creator of humans. <laughs> the sun God. The sun God, the creator of humans. Wait, is there something wrong with that? Does that bother you? Wow, really? And so the sun God is put in his place, right? God causes darkness, pitch black, a darkness that can be felt for three days and three nights. The God, the moon God also, here's, this, these are paintings from ancient tombs, by the way, in Egypt. There's the sun god on an ancient tomb. Here's the moon god again on an ancient to- tomb. It's there in the, king's val- the valley of the kings. The Bible says in Romans 1.25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Lord, have mercy. Worshipping the creature, the created, rather than the creator. The Egyptians worshipping the sun and the moon rather than the God who created everything. Does it happen today? It does, doesn't it? To worship the creation rather than the creator. Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice them to the Lord our God. Therefore, our livestock too shall go with us. Not a, what? Not a hoof shall be left behind. For we shall take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And until we arrive there, we ourselves do not know with what we shall serve the Lord. It seems like even in all of this, Moses and God may have a sense of humor. Not a hoof shall be left. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He was not willing to let them go. And Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Beware, do not see my face again. For in the day you shall see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, You are right. I shall never see your face again. Whew. Wow. How, how do you think Pharaoh feels right now? <laughs> Jonathan says he should be scared. <laughs> you know, when we read the account of the last days of this earth's history, are the wicked scared? Maybe at the very end on the last day, but they're not scared running up to that, are they? And Pharaoh should be scared, but he's not, he doesn't seem to be. He's angry. Because he has continually hardened his heart. And God is trying to bring him into submission to say, Hey, Pharaoh, you're not God. You're not a God. And the gods that your people worship are not gods. There's only one God. I'm he and I'm on my throne. Pharaoh, wake up. Wake up. Hebrews says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you're reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Discipline is a blessing. If not, if not for discipline, every person would, would do what was right in their own eyes. Auntie Addie, say amen. Auntie Addie says, I believe in discipline. Auntie Bobby, do you say Amen. She was telling me about discipline the other day when I saw saw her at the doctor's office. (laughs) I'm not talking about child abuse, okay? I know there's extreme forms. I realize that, okay? So I I recognize that. We're talking about discipline to teach the children the right way to go, amen? It's a blessing from heaven. Uh, if, If there's no discipline, and there's discipline in the church too. God is a God of order, and if there's no discipline, then Lord have mercy on us. We could go on the wrong way, huh? And so God provides discipline too. He says, you know, if we, did, if we didn't love our children, we wouldn't discipline them. Because we love them, we don't allow them to, as Auntie Patty says, run out into the street. And I finally realized one day, she lived here on the highway that where they drive 55 miles an hour. They're barreling down the hill from up on on the mountain coming from Humatic, coming down. She lived on that highway. I always thought she lived, you know, there behind the safe gates in the quiet, peaceful suburb of Adventist World Radio. And she didn't. She lived out on the highway there. And there wasn't even a fence for a while, right? Small children. That's terrifying to a parent. And so she 
put the fear of the Lord into them, you do not go out into the street because you'll die in the street. Was it because she hated her children that she disciplined them? Oh, no, it was because she loved them. Did you discipline your children, Auntie Addie, because you hated them? You love them, right? You wanted to prepare them for life in this world that's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's scary. And, and if we didn't discipline our children, we didn't love them. So praise God for a little discipline. I realize, and sometimes we think God went too far. He's God. He's God. He wanted to save Pharaoh. And sometimes, I don't know, parents go to drastic means to try and wake their children up. They don't want them to end up on, 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 um, with a death sentence. They don't want to end up, end up in prison with a life sentence. Amen? They want them to grow up to be servants to the people, to bless others, to be a blessing to this world. And so sometimes parents go to extreme measures. I'm not, again, I'm not promoting child abuse. Don't get me wrong, but, but you know, God goes to extreme measures. So wake up! Wake up! You're on the wrong track. You're on the path to destruction. I love you. Will you wake up before you d destroy yourself? Pharaoh, wake up! And even Pharaoh's servants were saying, Pharaoh, wake up! If you don't stop, we're going to die. This God is the real deal. Yahweh is the real thing. These gods we've served, we can see they have no power. Wake up. The one that the Lord loves. The scripture says right there, it's the one who the Lord loves that he disciplines. Amen? Who is it that God dis disciplines? It's the one he loves. That's the one. When we go through these afflictions, when we go through these trials, and again, it's not God always. We live in a sinful world. And, uh, and Adam and Eve, before they sinned, they didn't have to go through affliction. Amen? And he heaven, we won't be going through these trials and afflictions. We won't. Without sin, there's no need. But because of sin and a sinful nature, these things allow us to realize, you've, you may have heard it said, he or she ha had to hit rock bottom before they turned and, and looked up. Right? Unshackled says, Doo, do, do, do. and then he faced himself and thought, <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking, maybe you never heard that program, but, <laughs> right? I'm, sometimes we have to hit rock bottom before we, we finally say, Lord, where's the light? Have mercy on me. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says what? It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'm so glad that that's only the beginning, amen? You know, again, John 3.16 says, God, so what? He loved the world. I don't see one of the, the gifts of the Spirit as fear. Is that, listed, is that listed as the fruit of the Spirit? Is, is fear listed as the fruit of the Spirit? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And you know what? Sometimes in the beginning we might fear our parents, but when we realize, when we have a deeper understanding as we grow and mature, when we're two years old, sometimes it's only the wooden spoon that puts the fear of the Lord in us. <laughs> sometimes, but as we grow, I love my mama. I love her. I appreciate what she's done for me, me you know? Where would I be without my parents' discipline? I praise God for that. The fear of the Lord is what? It is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end, hallelujah. It's only the beginning. It's the start. If Pharaoh had truly feared the Lord, it would have, begin, it would have been the beginning of his understanding of the true God. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord may be begin, the beginning, but the end is a deep love. Amen? It's a love that goes beyond understanding how great the Father's love for us that we should be called the sons and the daughters of God. Amen? We are children of God. And Pharaoh, he's counted too. If he would only recognize, if he would only turn and repent, he could experience God's love too. Job, we read this last week, he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Gold has to be heated in the fire to remove its impurities in excess of a thousand degrees. I don't know what that feels like, but I guarantee you, if you touch that, that's a burn that is a very severe burn. What is that? Fourth degree plus? 
You don't want to feel that kind of pain. But gold is tried through the fire. And the adversities of this life either cause us, it's up to us. Will we rebel? Some children re choose rebellion against their parents, don't they? Even though the parents have done everything they can, they've prayed for that child, they've guided that child, they've nursed it, they've loved it, they've provided for its needs, and that child reaches a point, I re reached a point in my life where I was a rebellious teenager. It's a choice that we can make, right? We can choose to rebel or we can choose to realize that this affliction is for our good and God has a purpose in it all. And God has a plan for us. He had a plan for the children of Israel. He, he had a plan for the Egyptians too, amen? He wanted to save them too, amen? He wanted to show them that their gods were false and that he, their salvation was available to him. This is, what I, this is what I want to encourage you. There may be some other lessons here, but these are just a few highlights. God is the true source of life. Worshiping his creation, it's idolatry. It's idolatry. He is the only Yahweh. He is the only one who has ever been and ever will be. He is the only creator. And God gives signs that his deliverance is near. I thought you'd say amen to that. <laughs> is deliverance near on this in this story? <laughs> You've been longing for it, amen? You've been praying for it. May those Israelites be delivered soon. But deliverance is near for us too, amen? There are signs that deliverance is near. God does discipline the ones he loves. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I can say amen to that. I know that in my life. I know some of you could say amen to that. <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't make that up. That's biblical, isn't it? God disciplines the one he, ones he loves. Auntie Patty's nodding her head. Amen. Sorry, I'm not trying to pick on you today. <laughs> God disciplines the one he loves. I can say amen to that. I know that in my life. You can say amen to that. You know the fires of, fires of affliction. God has a plan through it all. He's preparing me. He wants to save me in his kingdom. And nothing can bring us through the tribulation, but who's going to bring you through? It's nothing but the power of Jesus. Amen. He's the only one that can bring us through. He's going to see us through. He saw the Israelites through, and he will see us through. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. Thank you. We don't understand everything, Father, but we understand that you're a God of mercy and grace, that you want to save whosoever, that no one is too far from your reach, including Pharaoh, and so that means we're not too far from your reach. Father, we give you a praise and hallelujah for that. Father, touch our hearts. Draw us to you. If we haven't come to you yet, Father, we come to you now and we say, Lord, have mercy on us as sinners. We come to you asking, Father, that you would come into our hearts and lives and that you would soften us. Help us, Father, to have a soft heart to realize that you love us and that everything we go through has a purpose and a reason and that you love us and that you're preparing us for your soon coming. Father, we look forward to the deliverance that is coming. We praise your holy name. We thank you for Jesus who's going to see us through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.